Just two days before Halloween, on an otherwise ordinary cold October night in Johnstown, New York, in 2019, 22-year-old Elizabeth Lamont clocked in for her shift at a local deli, never suspecting that anything out of the ordinary would happen to her that day. Allie was seemingly loved by everyone in her life. She had a close circle of family and friends and a positive relationship with her new boyfriend. She was working hard to save some money and carve out a space in the world that was her own. Little did she know that among the people in her everyday life, there was a sinister plot lurking beneath the surface. As this disturbing story unfolds, I'll uncover a complex web of lies, betrayal, and darkness. As always, this is a tough story to unravel, but it's an important one to share. Allie deserves to have her story told, and we could all use a reminder that sometimes even the most terrifying monsters are hidden in plain sight, and doing the right thing can go horribly wrong. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you've never been here before, I'm Kimberlea. Nice to finally meet you. And if you didn't notice the intro, this is the first video in my All Hollows Horrors Halloween series. It's a lot to say. And it will be running from now until the end of October. And also, my podcast is launching on Halloween. So you have that to look forward to as well. And one of you actually came up with the name for this series, so congratulations to Amanda Floyd. And I'm going to be sending out a fall care package to thank you and also thank all of you for participating. And an honorable mention and shout out to Misty, who came up with Kimbu Leia. I thought that was cute. I should definitely introduce myself that way for this entire series, but I think it'll confuse people who have never been here before. There were so many creative entries. You all are very very talented, so thank you. I cannot believe that it's already October, and for the past few months now, I've been dedicated to changing my lifestyle to be healthier, to get better sleep, eat more nutritiously, and be active, and I've incorporated the Aura Ring, that's what this is, to track my progress. And if you've been here for a while, then you've seen me talk about other things that I've been using as well. Well, anytime I find something that works and that I love, I share. And today our sponsor AG1 is yet another powerful life change I've made and I want to thank AG1 for sponsoring this video. I learned about it from another YouTuber that I know, trust, and love and I hope that I'm that person for you if this is the first time that you're hearing about it. AG1 is a daily foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health. As someone as busy as I am, I cannot start a routine that's hard to stick with. I just won't do it. So if you're anything like me, you'll love how easy this is. I drink AG1 every morning and it's so simple. I use the metal scoop it comes with, which I love because it gives you the perfect serving size every single time. Then I put it into a shaker bottle with eight ounces of cold water and shake. I either drink it straight from the bottle or I put it in a glass like this one. That's it. I just got 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients all at once to support optimal health for my brain, body, and gut. Plus it actually tastes good. I was pleasantly surprised. I'm really picky about so many things, but I was excited that AG1 was so good because I knew that I was gonna stick with it. I'm someone who does not like to take a bunch of vitamins, so I love how easy it is to drink AG1. I'm also a vegetarian, and I was not getting my daily requirement of nutrients, and now I'm getting nutrient replenishment from AG1, which contains a broad spectrum of micronutrients and phytonutrients to help my body stay nourished all day, every day. Even when I'm on the go, I just got back from Florida and CrimeCon and I'm leaving tomorrow for Dallas and AG1 offers lightweight travel packs to take your daily routine on the go. Traveling is stressful enough. I don't need another thing to worry about. And AG1 helps with stress and mood balance. Who doesn't need that? I know I do. It has powerful plant extracts, herbs, and antioxidants to help support your metabolism and promote mental clarity, alertness, 
and better focus and I can feel it. I'm much more alert and energized after drinking AG1 and that makes me want to keep going and never miss a day. It has quickly become part of my daily routine now and I don't want to go without it. Plus, I'm not as young as I feel and I love that AG1 helps support healthy aging. It has CoQ10 and phytonutrients from whole foods which promote longevity. By supporting cellular metabolism and health of the skin, brain, and heart, and anytime anything can help my skin and my hair look better, sign me up. I encourage you to try it out. I'm telling you it's worth it. So get yours by going to drinkag1.com slash Kimberlea to get started on your order. AG1 is going to give my community a free one-year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Thanks so much once again to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. The cases in the series happened on or around Halloween or the month of October. Each one of them has their own haunting twist to them, and today I'll be introducing you to Elizabeth Lamont. The first thing I noticed was the spelling of her name. It's not the traditional Elizabeth with an E, no, no, no. It's spelled Elizabeth, A-L-L-Y-Z-I-B-E-T-H. And you know what? I like it. I've seen a lot of people make fun of unique spellings of people's names, even mine. I've never seen Elizabeth spelled this way and I think it's really cool. It definitely stands apart. Elizabeth Ann Lamont was born in Johnstown, New York on December 4th, 1996 to her parents Sherman and Krista Lamont. Elizabeth had three sisters, two older sisters, Carly, who was three years older, and Llewellyn, who was about a year older than her, and she had a little sister that was two years younger named Brooke. She was close to all of them. She considered her sisters her best friends. They had a really special and strong bond. The Lamont family lived in Gloversville. It's a small town in Saratoga County. It's north of Albany and upstate New York. Now, I've never heard about this area before, and you know how interested I am in understanding the life that people live that we get to know in these cases. And when I think of upstate New York, I think of Syracuse and Gloversville is not quite like that area. Here it is on the map. It's a pretty small town. From what I could see, there was only one elementary, middle, and high school, which means everyone who lived there would be somewhat familiar with the people they grew up with going to school together and moving through that single educational system. The average income in this area is around $40,000 a year, and most people rent places instead of purchasing homes because the property tax is actually really high among other reasons, of course. I also learned that one of the pros, according to Google, but I think it was probably misplaced in that category, and it's more of a con, is that a lot of places are run down. There's a lot of run down areas, and I did see a lot of abandoned homes when I was looking at Google Maps. The job opportunities in the small town are not many, and sadly, it's reported that over 16% of the residents there are actually living in poverty. What the Lamonts did not have in wealth, they made up for with strong relationships. They valued family and they leaned on one another for support. Now, Elizabeth's friends and family knew her as Allie and that's what she preferred to be called. So from here on out, that is what I'm going to do as well. Allie attended Gloversville High School and from what I could gather from her Facebook profile, she began attending in 2011 and she had many, many close friends. They took a lot of photos together and they looked like typical teens having fun in between going to school and figuring out what they wanted to do after graduation. Growing up in a very supportive environment helped Allie develop a strong sense of community and a desire to help others. Allie's dad, Sherman, described his daughter as someone who always stood up for others and looked after people. He admired her selflessness and her willingness to put others' needs before her own. Everyone close to Allie agreed she was a remarkable young woman who had strong connections with people in her life. Allie deeply understood the importance of caring for others and she was always there to help. Allie was more than just a familiar face in Gloversville. She was a symbol of the small town spirit that held this community together. By all accounts, she loved her hometown and she didn't have any desire to leave, not even for a brief time. And it's not all the time we hear that. We usually hear the small town girl wanted big city life, but Allie, she wasn't like that. And within the confines of this cozy little city, it seemed that Allie found everything that she needed. And once she became an adult, she took the next step towards independence by moving out of the family home. But Allie's heart always remained close 
to those that she loved. Never a day went by without her checking in and touching base with someone in her family or one of her friends. By 2019, Allie was living with her childhood friend, Jenny, and they were close since they were 13 years old. Although she enjoyed spending time with Jenny and Jenny's young daughter, Allie had goals of her own. Her dream was to move into a place of her own and really build the life she wanted. I think that's so relatable for many of us, the longing for personal space, especially when you're growing up in a bustling household with a number of siblings. So no doubt, Allie would have felt like she wanted that time for some peace and quiet on her own terms. Something I noticed and I wanted to point out and commend her on and her sister Brooke is how well they could do makeup. That winged eyeliner, it's perfection. I can't, my hands are not steady enough, but I did take note that both of them really enjoyed getting dolled up, and you can tell they were very talented when it came to makeup skills. By March of 2019, Allie was one step closer to her goal. She landed a job at a popular deli nearby called Local Substation Number 9. It was only about 10 minutes away from Jenny's place, which was great because Allie did not have a vehicle. She did not drive yet, so she had to rely on friends and family to give her a lift whenever she needed one. Now, Local 9 wasn't just a job for Allie. She wasn't there just to make ends meet. She wanted to achieve things for her future, so she was very diligent. She intended on starting behind the counter and then moving her way up over time. She was dedicated to all of her responsibilities, but more than that, Allie was dedicated to people. She stood out. She had these big blue eyes, her makeup, the way she carried herself, and of course, how helpful and pleasant she was. But not only was she a fixture at the local substation for all the customers who came in, but she made friends with her coworkers. She was always there to help. One thing Allie was known for was making sure everyone who was in need was protected and taken care of. There was a time when a fellow coworker had nowhere to sleep one night. She was gonna have to spend the night out on the street, but Allie would not let that happen. She gave her a place to stay. She said if it wasn't for Allie, something really bad could have happened to her that night. Another coworker was suffering from a panic attack and Allie jumped into action. She rushed her into the bathroom, which was one of the only private areas in the deli, and she held her as she cried. She said Allie always had kind words for everyone. Her hard work was recognized by her boss as well, 51-year-old Georgios Cacavelos. He owned this deli along with his wife. Ali ended up taking over a lot of the management duties alongside the official manager, 34-year-old James Duffy, who everyone called Jimmy. Ali also considered Jimmy a very good friend along with his girlfriend, Kristen, who also worked at the local nine. For more than six months, Ali worked hard at this deli. She was trying to save enough money to move out on her own. She was dedicated and motivated and on a clear path towards her goals. That fall, she also made it official with a new boyfriend, William Deming. They made it Facebook official on October 4th, 2019. So things were really coming together for Allie. But unfortunately, this is where the positive part of the story comes to an end. Things took a turn for the worst when just two days before Halloween, on Tuesday, October 29th, 2019, a call came in to the Gloversville Police Department around 10 p.m. Officer Chad Simonson answered the phone that night it was one of Allie's older sisters. She said she hadn't heard from Allie since the day before on Monday, and members of the Lamont family were growing increasingly concerned because none of them could get a hold of Allie, and that was very out of character for her not to be in contact with them regularly. On a Facebook post from Allie's older sister Carly earlier that day, she explained, quote, if I don't get a confirmation that anyone has seen or heard from Elizabeth, I will be filing a missing persons report. Any information on her whereabouts and safety, please PM me, end quote. It's clear that no one reached out that night with information on Allie's whereabouts, and that is what led to this call. The first thing Officer Simonson did is he looked to see if any reports had come in that day that involved Allie's name or description. There was nothing on record, but there was something. Simonson had a gut feeling from the minute he answered Allie's sister's call. He just felt like something wasn't right. And that's different from what we're used to hearing. This was a rookie cop, but maybe that meant he didn't have a jaded perspective that a lot of veteran cops had when they just assume, you know what? It's an adult. They ran away. No need to worry, but no, something about this did not sit right with him that night. Simonson gathered as much information from Allie's sister that he could about Allie including her last known address on record, which was at 71 Division Street, apartment one. And it's late, 
but Simonson heads out anyway. It's only a three minute drive from the police station. Here is Division Street, and you can see some of those rundown homes that I mentioned seeing when I was on Google Maps. But when Officer Simonson arrived, he realized this was most likely Allie's last address before she moved because the apartment was vacant. And we know she's actually living with her friend, Jenny. By this time, Allie's sisters had actually gotten in touch with Jenny. And when Simonson returned to the station around 11 p.m., he received a phone call from her. She was also concerned because she had not heard from Allie since the previous day. After speaking with Simonson, Jenny decides that she wants to go ahead and file that missing persons report. And even though it's late, once again, Simonson proceeds to drive over to Jenny's and the two of them sit down to talk about the last time Jenny saw her best friend. The previous afternoon of October 28th, Allie was at work at the local nine. Jenny gets a text from her around 4.29 p.m. Allie texted Jenny and said, can you bring me my phone charger? And Jenny responded with, sure, be there soon. But a minute later at 4.30, Allie said, thanks so much. Then Jenny told Officer Simonson that she drove over to the deli and she dropped off the charger. That was actually the last time she saw her. And since Jenny usually gave Allie a ride to and from work, Jenny texted her around 6.26 p.m. and she said, when will you be getting off work? But to her surprise, she didn't hear back from Allie. But knowing her usual schedule and that local nine closes at 8 p.m., Jenny texted her again at 7.55 and she said, will you be getting out at eight? Still nothing, no response, no call, no text, no nothing. And that was odd. How was Allie going to get home that night? Well, she didn't get home that night, which really worried Jenny. So by the next morning, when there was still no word, Jenny actually drove over to Allie's work to see if anyone knew where she was or where she went after her shift was over. Did someone else pick her up? Well, Jenny ends up speaking to Jimmy. That's the manager. And he was on duty and he said he had seen Allie but she was not scheduled that day, which made it even more peculiar and mysterious. Because if she wasn't working and she wasn't home, then where was she? She wasn't with her parents or her siblings, so where could she possibly be? Jenny told Simonson that Allie maintained a very close group of friends and family members, and she was regularly in contact with them. So if none of them had heard from her, that's a huge red flag. The next logical person to check in with was Allie's boyfriend, William. It's late, but that didn't matter to Simonson. He drove out there, but William was nowhere to be found. However, William's brother answered the door and he explained to the officer that William was actually out searching for Allie. This situation was getting more and more concerning. It seemed like no one in Allie's close-knit circle of friends and family knew where she was. As they begin to realize the gravity of the situation, Simonson decides he's going to go ahead and issue a BOLO to every law enforcement agency statewide. And in case you're not familiar with the term, BOLO just stands for be on the lookout. I'm sure you've heard it before, but I like to explain these things sometimes. So now law enforcement agencies would be actively searching for an individual who is wanted or missing and to keep an eye out. It also signifies a higher level of urgency. And I have to say, I'm pretty impressed by the quick response and dedication that Simonson had to the situation, especially in a small town. But Gloversville was a place where everyone seemed to know everyone. And the sudden disappearance of one of their own definitely started to raise the alarm, especially a vibrant and young 22 year old woman who has seemingly vanished into thin air. Do you ever realize how many phrases we got from William Shakespeare? I know it's off topic, but that's one of them vanished out of thin air. It's actually two phrases put together from Othello and the Tempest and there is about 1,700 other words and phrases that he came up with that we still use today, especially in true crime, I find, and it blows my mind. So if you hear another one in this video, comment below. By the morning of October 30th, Simonson's night shift was over and there were still no reports of Allie being spotted. So Simonson had to relay all of Allie's information to his shift sergeant that morning, and he too thought they needed to look into this as soon as possible. Once apprised of the details, two detectives were actually assigned to this case, Detective Jillian Favell and Detective Sergeant Lucas Nellis. It's actually pretty uncommon for them to get a missing persons report in regard to an adult. They usually deal with teenagers who turn up as runaways, so the detectives begin their investigation by going back to basics and revisiting Jenny Young, Allie's friend and roommate. They want to know if there's anything unusual going on with Allie, especially the last time Jenny saw her. But she says, no, not at all. 
Allie's demeanor when she dropped off the phone charger was normal. They actually had plans to go trick-or-treating with Jenny and her daughter on Halloween, and Allie was her usual self. She was laughing and joking around, and there was nothing that stood out as being off. Then, detectives inquire if Allie had any issues with anyone or if she was going through anything in her life that would make her want to leave town. Jenny's like, no, not at all. She did recently start dating a guy named William, and things were going well with them as far as she knew, so that's what she told the detectives. She also said Allie was in a good mood. She seemed genuinely happy about their upcoming Halloween plans. But not too long after this, the detectives got some information from inside the police department. They had run Allie's name, and they discovered that there had been an incident, a domestic incident, with an ex-boyfriend named Tyler. And understandably, this definitely made some red flags go up once again. They jumped on this lead immediately. Could Tyler have found out that Allie had a new boyfriend? and decided to harm her. Was this a case of if I can't have her, no one can? Well, they go to his last known address to pay him a little unannounced visit, but he's nowhere to be found. So although they're having some issues tracking down Allie's ex-boyfriend Tyler, in the meantime, detectives decide to try William once again, her current boyfriend, and they do end up making contact. And from his account, their relationship was very positive, it was healthy, and he was really forthcoming about the last time he talked to his girlfriend, as well as his whereabouts at the time of her disappearance. William said that they had been texting back and forth on October 28 when she was working her shift at Local 9. The last text, and he showed him the phone, came in at 6.39 p.m., and it was just small talk. The weird thing is, William told investigators that he and Allie, they would text or message on Facebook all day, every day, when they weren't together, even if she was at work. They even did video chats while she was on her shift. But that evening, while in the middle of messaging over Facebook, all of a sudden, her responses stopped. She wasn't answering, and William tried texting her and calling her. And he did not stop all night, even after she should have been off work. And at that point, he noticed his messages were not going through at all. He also told the detectives that Allie usually came over to his place after work most days, but he didn't hear from her that night. And they were supposed to get together the following day on Tuesday to carve pumpkins with William's son. He did not know what happened to her. So he ends up going to meet with some friends that night. And where did they go? They went to the cemetery. Why? Well, they went there, according to William, to have some beers. And now that's an interesting setting, but it was close to Halloween. So I guess it could be fitting. William tells detectives that when they were done, he crashed at a friend's house and he was worried about Allie all night and he could not sleep. When he didn't get in contact with her the next day, he went out looking. He spent hours in the woods and looking on the roadsides and he even met up with Jenny and they both were searching. Neither one of them had stopped calling her since their last text. And that's when William finally reached out to Allie's sister, Llewellyn, on the night of the 29th and explained that no one had spoken to Allie since the evening before. It was now going on the second day and she was nowhere to be found. When Llewellyn checked around with friends and family, she confirmed no one had seen her. That's when that call to police went out. Aside from the chilling setting that William and his friends went to to grab a cold one, nothing seemed to miss with the way he recounted what happened up until this point. And William's concern for Allie was regarded as completely genuine. But as you probably know, no one is going to be completely ruled out as having nothing to do with her disappearance until she's found alive or they rule them out as suspects. So they still want to keep an eye on William. And we know all too well that partners, statistically, are one of the most likely people responsible for causing harm to those close to them, and that's very sad but true. During this time, Allie's friends and her family members are taking matters into their own hands. They're reaching out to people, and they're trying to spread the word with the help of social media. They were getting the attention of news stations who were tweeting out Allie's picture and asking if anyone had seen her. They'd also been posting missing persons posters everywhere. The community's concern was evident in the effort that they were putting out there, and that was a testament to the impact Allie had on everyone's life. They were out there searching. They were handing out flyers. They were asking around. They were actually doing their own investigation. And of course, theories were being formed, but I mean, naturally, when it comes to true crime, many times it's the boyfriend or the ex-boyfriend so all eyes were on Tyler and William. Here's an update that Llewellyn posted on October 30th after she talked with police. It said, quote, the police contacted me. 
My sister's cell phone dinged four miles away out in Hales Mills right before being shut off. That was the last location the police were able to find for her phone. I don't know how her supposed to be going home after work and coming to Gloversville leads to her being four miles away. It was an answer, but not one any of us were hoping for or expecting. My anxiety is through the roof right now. I just want my little sister to be safe. This is a picture of my sister. We just want her home safely. We love you so much, end quote. And then she also tagged Allie's Facebook account. Now, I looked up Hell's Mills, and here is where this is in reference to the local Nine Deli. Apparently, this would have been entirely out of the way for Allie to be out there four miles away, especially because we know she doesn't drive. It's in this area where there's just a lot of land, and there's nothing really out there except for what appears to be cornfields. So why would Allie be all the way out there? Now, I've gotten many comments that you really like seeing Facebook posts because it helps to humanize the people I'm talking about, and it also gives us a lot of context. These are things that won't be in the news or on shows, and it's one of my favorite things to really dive into. I want to know what was actually happening in regard to friends and family. Well, after Llewellyn posted that her little sister was missing and that her phone pinged out in Hales Mills, she got 286 comments on that post. And there was one from a person named Matthew that said he lived out on the 29 and wanted to know when Allie's phone died because he could go out and look around in that area near him and ask anyone if they saw her. That was very nice of him. And well, Llewellyn responded that it was around 7.40 p.m. on Monday night. That's important because that means her phone was turned off before her shift ended that night. Not to mention it pinged before it was turned off. So that would suggest, if this information is correct, that she left work at some point with someone. But who? We know her phone probably didn't just die because she got that charger from Jenny earlier that day, so it's very odd. This same day, the detectives finally managed to reach Allie's ex-boyfriend, Tyler, who agreed to come in for questioning. His criminal history included disorderly conduct complaints and that domestic incident with Allie. That made him a person of interest right away. Tyler had a bad reputation, but he appeared to be very cooperative during questioning in this interview. He told investigators that he and Allie had gotten into a domestic dispute and it turned physical. He admitted that the incident resulted in her sustaining injuries, but he claimed that this was an isolated incident, that it was the first and last time that anything like this happened during the course of their entire relationship. He went on to explain the background of this incident. In his words, he and Allie had been together for four years and things took a turn one night when she showed up at his apartment unannounced about two months ago. She was fired up and she seemed ready to get into an argument because she had heard that he was cheating on her with one of her best friends. When he was asked how exactly Allie received these injuries, Tyler claimed that because she was being so combative, he had to restrain her. But isn't that what they always say? But you know what? We weren't there. And Allie isn't here to defend herself and to tell her side of the story, so we will never know exactly what happened. But his side of the story is that after the heated blow-up, he blocked her number, he blocked all of her social media accounts, and he hadn't heard one single word from her since that night. He assured the police he had absolutely nothing to do with Allie's disappearance. But given the history of violence between them, they were not ready to close this chapter yet. They still had their eye on Tyler, but his story did exonerate him a little bit. It made him look, I guess, less guilty. And even though these things did happen, there's nothing to actually hold him on. So he's free to go. The detectives do decide to look a little deeper into Tyler and Allie's relationship. They cross-reference his statements with other accounts and there didn't seem to be any recent communication with Allie. As it turns out, this is not the first time that Allie has gone missing. She had been known to run away when she was younger. In fact, there had been numerous missing persons reports filed about her when she was a teenager. But on the other hand, they needed to acknowledge the fact that this disappearance was quite different. She was a responsible young woman. She was an adult, not a young girl. She held down a steady job and she was in contact with her family all the time and she'd never been missing for this long before. So as the police are working hard to piece everything together, Allie's boyfriend, William, comes in to the police station and he also had some upsetting news. He told them that Allie had been really depressed lately. He said that she even considered treatment and being hospitalized. 
She walked into St. Mary's Hospital to check herself in, but once there, she decided it wasn't an option for her because she did not have access to health insurance. And this was like just a couple weeks before this happened. William just couldn't get the thought out of his head that she might have caused harm to herself. The investigators couldn't rule it out completely. Allie's mental state could have played a pivotal role in why she just vanished. It wasn't clear why William would have held back because he seemed to be so straightforward when they talked to him the first time, but it was most likely because he wanted to protect his girlfriend's privacy. But as time went on, he knew that he had to let them know. I saw a Facebook post on Allie's account from over a month before she went missing. It was from September 2nd. It said, quote, it's with a heavy heart I have to do this, but I'm looking for someone or a family to take in my two handsome, loving tuxedo cats. Their names are Gizmo and Frankenstein, one and two years old. Unfortunately, due to circumstances in my life, they're better off with a loving family who has the time they deserve. Frankenstein is neutered, Gizmo is not. I do not wish to separate the two. I would love for them to stay together. They are very close to each other. Gizmo loves his big brother. They come with food, litter, cat tree, collars, and very different bubbly personalities. Please help me find my baby's forever homes." End quote. That's sad. There was definitely a lot going on in Allie's life that she had to feel like she had to give away her beloved pets. This gives us an idea of her state of mind a month before she disappeared, rehoming her two cats that she was so very attached to. But of course, this could be due to the fact that she was moving around a lot to different apartments and different friends' homes, and with her work schedule now, maybe she just couldn't take care of them. But it could have also been because of what William said, that Allie was very depressed. Giving things away is another sign that someone may have plans to do something to themselves. These are just all clues to be taken into consideration. But from what Jenny relayed to the investigators, Allie was fine. She was happy. She was looking forward to Halloween. So they definitely needed more information. The investigation into Allie and the month's disappearance had taken on even more urgency. Time was going by and they just got dead end after dead end. The detectives were feeling the pressure and they wanted to find answers. So the deli where Allie worked and was last seen became their central focus. Investigators figured that her coworkers who had seen her on a regular basis for the last six months may have even more context to provide. So they head over to Local 9. Now keep in mind, the store doesn't open until 11 a.m. The investigators were going over there before opening, so when they get there, the door's locked. However, the lights were on. It looked like someone had been inside preparing for the morning shift, but there was just no one in sight. They checked the exterior, and they noted that there was a handwritten sign taped to the window that indicated that the store was undergoing renovations. But since it looked like it was operational, the investigators didn't know when that was posted. It could be old. You know how these things happen, like people forget to take down a sign? Or it could be new. Maybe they were starting soon. Either way, they wanted to see if anyone had come in that day. So they walk around the building and they spot two people out by the dumpsters on site. Law enforcement had made several attempts already to call the store, hoping to speak to Allie's manager, but so far, all the calls to the actual shop had not been returned. Both of the people out there by the dumpsters ended up being employees of Local 9, including Kristen, who was the girlfriend of the manager, Jimmy. The investigators introduced themselves and they asked Kristen the last time she saw Allie and she explains she was not working on October 28th, but her boyfriend was. He was the person that was responsible for closing the store the evening that Allie disappeared. But Kristen explains Jimmy's not there right now, the owner barely comes in, and Jimmy would be their main point of contact, so she gives them his phone number and the phone number of the owner of the store, Georgios. So the investigators go ahead and make calls to both Jimmy and Georgios, and they don't get an answer from either one. With time continuing to go by, the detectives decide they need help, so they call for assistance from the New York State Police, and they send in their major crimes unit task force led by investigator John Nigro and investigator Darren Jones. They're going off the lead that Allie may have been depressed, so they check all the hospitals, the mental health facilities, and they're not able to locate her. And now that the state police had joined forces with the local detectives, they go back to Local 9 hoping they're gonna get an interview with Jimmy since now it's during business hours. So I'm gonna provide a little background and the context on how things actually operated at Local 9. Georgios was the owner, as I explained. He owned a number of diners. And when it came to this sandwich shop where Ali worked, he opened it in 2018 and he relied heavily on Jimmy Duffy to manage the establishment from day to day. The other employees were Allie, of course, Kristen, who I talked about, she's Jimmy's girlfriend, 
and another girl named Nicole, and that was it. When the investigators get there, Jimmy's there to greet them. The investigative team introduced themselves, and they asked to speak to Jimmy and Giorgio's, who had come in that day, in order to meet with them and discuss the last time Allie had been on shift. Both Jimmy and his boss explained the last time anyone had seen Allie was on October 28th. That's Monday. Giorgio's told investigators that as a father himself, he thought of Allie like one of his own daughters and he had been increasingly concerned of her well-being because she had recently confided in him that she was dealing with depression and that she was having thoughts of ending her life. He could tell she was under a lot of pressure and what didn't help was that the night he saw her last at the shop, they had a mishap where the soda machines had leaked all over the floor. Allie did a lot for local night. She took on numerous managerial duties when Jimmy was unable to. Giorgios could tell that Allie had become very frustrated. Her shift was coming to an end that night. So he told her, listen, instead of you having to stay here and deal with this mess that we made, you can go. Go home, relax, take the rest of the night off. He also gave her a loan of $500. It was a cash advance because... He knew she was trying to get her own apartment. She had asked him for this loan. He knew she was desperately trying to get her own place. So he had her sign a handwritten note that night with the amount she was supposed to pay him back. And he has not heard from her since. So he hands over this note that Allie signed. It was acknowledging that she was gonna pay him back in increments of $50 until the 500 was paid in full. Giorgio said that he wanted to help Allie because he felt very protective over her. When the detective said, can we look around? Giorgio was like, yes, he invited them in. They could do a walkthrough of the entire property and whatever they needed, he was there to help. So that's what they did. Now, this place was not exactly the most, I would say, organized establishment. It was somewhat of a chaotic scene. It did indeed look like it was under construction. There were walls being torn down in the middle of the building, floors that needed to be scrubbed and were in the middle of being cleaned, and what looked like a major soda leak. There was soda syrup all over the tile floors. It was just a mess. Now, this didn't really raise any suspicion, but it did catch their attention because they have to take everything into consideration. The place was messy. Here's a picture of the back area. You can tell there's a portion of the vinyl flooring that's actually coming up in one spot. There's a mop bucket on the counter. That doesn't really look sanitary, especially since it's close to the condiments and there's a bunch of trash in the middle of the hallway that leads to the back door where the dumpsters were. There were a couple employees that were in the middle of cleaning when the investigators came through there. Jimmy kind of acknowledged that this was the normal course of business for them. Here's what another area looked like. It looks like it could use some work. There's wall panels that are missing. There looks like some plumbing is undone or just never been completed. The wash area contains some of those wall panels as well as more trash on the counter. Here's another view of that wall that's missing panels and it looks like they're fixing that area. Here are what looks like the new wall panels with the packaging still on. Even though the back looks like a mess and overall it looks like it could even be a potential health hazard, nothing was really that out of place. And the front looked fine. Sometimes that's the way establishments are. The front is fine. You know, what do they say? Business in the front, a party in the back. This is more like business in the front, a mess in the back. But as long as no one can see through that facade in the front where everything is nice and neat, may I take your order, everything's organized. I guess it really doesn't matter to them. It didn't look like anything more than a very poorly managed restaurant that probably needs more employees. And speaking of which, Giorgios does let them know about every person that works there, which I already mentioned, and he has one new employee. He had to hire them just a couple days ago, and their name was Ali. Clearly, he needs the help, and you'll know one reason why. Jimmy. Jimmy had been with Giorgios for a long time, and maybe he saw him as a son because remember he sees Allie like a daughter. Jimmy had worked at other businesses that Giorgio's ran and he had him come manage and open the local nine. But Jimmy was more interested in drinking than working. And that's why this place probably looked like this and Allie took on so many responsibilities. As a matter of fact, he reeked of alcohol and he was definitely intoxicated that morning and it was only 11 a.m. So investigators, they have so many more questions for Jimmy and Giorgios, and they want to get them on the record, so they ask them to come down to the station and both make formal statements. Once they're there, they're put in two separate rooms, and that's when it's even more obvious that Jimmy is heavily intoxicated, and it's very hard 
to get him to focus on anything. He's all over the place. He's standing up. He's sitting down. He's slurring his words. He's even yelling at the investigators to find his friend. Find my friend. Find my coworker. Calling Allie his best employee. I do have some of this interview. And I'm so glad that this is modern day footage because we get to see a clear picture of Jimmy right here. This will just give you an idea of what he looks like, what his demeanor is like. So I'll play it for you. I'm an alcoholic and I'm a drug addict. Do not tell my boss. <laughs> he admits he's an alcoholic and a drug addict and he doesn't want his boss to know. He appeared to be genuinely interested in assisting the investigators in finding his friend, Ali. But because of his demeanor, it was really hard to have a conversation with him. And this is a serious matter, and I'm pretty sure it's obvious that Jimmy is an alcoholic. But remember, Georgios isn't always in the shop. But at the later part of the interview, Jimmy's upset. He stands up, he's yelling at the investigators to find Ali. He wants to get his life back to normal. And yes, I'm sure these types of interviews can be very stressful. Listen, I want you to find my friend. I want you to bring my worker back to work, and I want you to sit there and f return my life back to work. Now they move on to the boss. They've gotten enough from Jimmy. And Georgios explains the last time he saw Ali. He tells them that day, it was Monday, October 28th, the soda machines needed changing. So he went there to assist Jimmy. They had been out of order for a while. They needed to get fixed and they need to be worked on as soon as possible. There's actually a sign that I saw right here. And it does indicate that the soda machines were not in service and they can't afford not to be selling drinks. So Allie's up front, she's taking orders. Well, one of the men that's working on the soda machines, they accidentally cut one of the hoses that led to the soda syrup. And I don't know if you've ever worked in a restaurant but this is bad. These type of soda machines, if you are not aware, they combine this concentrated, sticky, thick syrup with carbonated soda water, and that's how it comes out of the machine. Not only do you have to get the mixture right, I like it more syrupy actually, but you also have to handle these hoses with care, and they hadn't. So the syrup began to spill all over the place at a rapid speed. And of course, Allie being who she is, she comes over to help, and it's a big job, and she's a little frustrated. She was doing everything and she's always doing everything. She did not want to deal with it, which is understandable. I already explained that Giorgio's made the decision to let Ali leave early. He saw she was under a lot of pressure. He gave her the loan that she needed and that was the last time he saw her. When investigators asked for an approximate time that they think she left, it was between seven and eight o'clock that night. So there you have it. Both Jimmy and Giorgio saw Ali the same day that everyone else last spoke to her. She was helping with the zero uh, situation. She complained, she didn't want to do it. <laughs> she left around what time do you think? You already guess. So she took the $500 at night mm -hmm. and then left. What time she left? I would gotta say anywhere between seven and eight. She said, thank you, George. She said, thank you. Yes, okay. she said, thank you, George. I said, just be good. I yelled, just be good. And then she left. During the interview with detectives, Giorgio again mentions Ali's well-being. And you can tell that he definitely puts off that dad vibe. He said he even tried to help guide Ali, that he was aware that she had a past, it was a violent relationship with her ex-boyfriend, and he wanted her to take care of herself. But she was trouble, girl. She, it was rough. I tried to help her. I tried to be a father to her. Her boyfriend was beating her up. I felt bad for her. I treated her literally as... A daughter of mine. And he tried to be there to help her. He also thought that she may have been thinking of taking her own life. On one occasion, Giorgio said that Ali confided in him that she didn't want to be there anymore. And initially, he thought she was referring to work. But it was apparent after she continued to express herself that she meant she didn't want to live at all. Then one day she says to me, I don't want to be here. I had enough of it. I said, you, you mean you don't want to work anymore? I have enough of my life, she said. But detectives have to look down every avenue, so then they ask Giorgios if he thinks Jimmy could have anything to do with Allie's disappearance, because remember, Jimmy was also there that night. So Giorgios says, uh, no, that's not possible because Jimmy does not have the balls to do anything like that. He also doesn't have any reason to hurt Ali because they're close friends. The one thing we never talked to you about is, do you think Jim had anything to do with this between us? I really don't think so. He definitely have the balls to do. 
like anything to harm to her or uh, do anything to her or anything like that. They were friends. They were buddies. The one thing investigators want to know at this point was if he had made any phone calls to Allie or if there were any phone calls and texts between him and Jimmy. They just kind of want to know what he's been up to in the last few days. Were there any texts between Jimmy and him after Allie's disappearance, let's say? Just to be sure that there wasn't anything that Giorgio's, who seemed to play the fatherly role in his employees' lives, would be hiding for Jimmy, maybe covering for him in any way. After all, he says Jimmy's a good worker, but he also had a bad side. Initially, Giorgio's is hesitant he doesn't really want to share things that he refers to as private information, which only raised more questions. What was hidden in that communication history that he didn't want the investigators to find out about? Well, the way I understood it was that he and Jimmy had a habit of texting about women. Giorgios is married. Jimmy has a girlfriend. And Giorgio said that those conversations were none of the investigators' business. And that's understandable. But the investigators were like, we don't care about that. However, Giorgios made it clear that he did care, and he felt like it was an invasion of his privacy. So keep going down, keep. Then there's a couple calls, James right there. This one's 36 minutes long. You're the one with the information right now that can help us solve this. I'm not denying you the information. What I'm denying you is, is a lot of private, personal information. Here's the thing. These interviews are recorded and most people know that, and this is a serious matter. So it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to think, you know what? All this could have the potential to make it into the public, and that would be scary if you were having some unsavory conversations in regard to other women when you have a wife. You know, if he was cheating, that might cause his life to be in an uproar when he's not even involved. So he hesitated to show them anything on his phone, but eventually he did let them look through it as he was holding on to it. So he had a little bit of control over the situation. And honestly, he doesn't have to show him anything. He's not under arrest. He's not being detained. He's willingly giving them information. According to what the investigators could see when they were looking down his call log, they pointed to a 36-minute phone call and they wanted to know more about it. Is Giorgio hiding something? And he goes, no, I'm not. I'm not even covering for Jimmy. Instead, he says, I have to actually think about it. I don't remember what the call was about. We talk all the time. And he makes the comment, you know what? If it's about women, let's say, I don't want to divulge it. Why you stick up for Jimmy? Are you, are you, are you still sense? Up? Maybe he had something to do with it and you just don't want to come forward. What's the conversation you had with Jimmy that day? I want to remember it first. Because if it revolves around women, I don't want to play women. So I don't care. You, don't, you think we care? I don't care. I know. But I don't really care. I do. So you're not allowed to listen. That's what I'm taking right now. I prefer not. Giorgio's is free to go. And so is Jimmy. The same day on Facebook, there was some very interesting chatter going on. Lots of conversations in relation to what transpired. Llewellyn posts an update. She lets everyone know, quote, New York State Police took over the investigation. Conveniently, her video at work wasn't working that night. This is much bigger than anyone could imagine. My heart hurts so bad not knowing if my sister is alive, safe, okay somewhere. We are a wreck, end quote. This post got 40 comments and one stood out. So I opened the thread. Someone named Danny said, quote, I'd be checking out her boyfriend. How could he not know where she is? End quote. And that's a reasonable question. Well, William himself answers. And I gained a lot of insight in these next few posts. William says, quote, You realize I'm the one who let Llewellyn know I hadn't heard from Allie since Monday night and asked her if she had seen or heard from her. That is how we got to this point in the first place. She was talking to me on Facebook. And then she just stopped. And my messages wouldn't go through. And now two days has gone by. I spent hours today looking through woods and roadsides in Hales Mills with Allie's roommate, our close friend, and talking with the police all day and constantly calling. This isn't normal. And I was concerned. But sh I'm sorry, but I don't know where she is. She never came home or texted me. That's the whole point. Shaking my head. End quote. Well, I don't think anyone was expecting that response. Danny tagged William and responded by saying, quote, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I just heard you posted a photo with her recently. Damn, I hope she's okay and found soon. If the cameras magically stopped working, I'd check into who owns the place she works and question them, end quote. Right. 
So I don't know if you caught that in Llewellyn's post. Apparently the cameras at Local 9 were not working the night Ali was working. That place does not look that high tech or well put together, so I wouldn't even be surprised. But let's continue reading because these are people who know Allie. William responded again to Danny, and I believe he's referring to investigators. He said, quote, I don't know what they're doing at this point. They told me they can't give out any more info right now, but they were searching houses last I knew, friends of hers and whatnot, end quote. That was true. They were making their rounds at friends' houses, and I'll get to that in a moment. William went on to say that he doesn't know what to think at this point. He said, quote, I haven't slept since Monday night. Danny inquired about Allie's phone, asking if it had been on at all, and William said, nope, not once since 7.30 to 7.40 p.m. Monday night. Danny just says, ugh, something's not right. Was she upset? Were you two fighting at all to make her want to get away? I don't know. I don't think she'd put her family through all this. I just have a terrible feeling. William assured the group that no, they don't fight. They never fought. He talks to her all day, every day. She always checks in with him to see how his day is going. They're literally always in contact. And she spends most of her time with either him or her roommate, Jenny. So it made no sense to him. He goes on to explain that on Tuesday, she was supposed to come over on her day off and do stuff for Halloween, carve pumpkins and hang out with him and his son. And she didn't even go get her paycheck that day. Interesting. Well, we know that Ali was supposedly given that $500 in cash. So maybe grabbing her paycheck wasn't a priority. However, you'd think if she was gathering money for a deposit on an apartment, she would want every single cent that she could get her hands on. So it does seem a bit odd. Later that night, Danny asked William for an update. And all he mentioned was that the local nine had been closed that day. But that could have been due to the fact that Jimmy and Georgios were both at the police station and the investigators were searching the shop. But by that night, Llewellyn has a final update. She says, quote, thank you to everyone for your support right now. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. Please keep sharing in hopes that something comes up and I will try to get back to everyone in the morning. I've been talking to police and people all day long trying to find leads on her whereabouts. I've slept for about two hours in the last 48, I'm exhausted mentally and physically. I love you so much. And she tags Ali. I pray you're somewhere safe. We will find you. I promise we will. Until we know where my sister is, our hearts will continue to hurt. Our minds will be in a daze. And that was the end of her post. I feel for her and for Ali's family and her loved ones. And I commend them on all of their efforts. I see this more and more where the families are even conducting their own investigations. And I think it's the smart thing to do. But the next day is Halloween. And that morning, Llewellyn is back on Facebook giving another update. She tells them that they went to the deli where Allie works and they were closed and under construction and that she went around and asked other businesses in the area and no one had anything good to say about the owner or the manager, Jimmy and how they treated their employees. Yikes, that's not good. And I'm not sure what the updates were that they were getting from police, but at this point, by the sound of William's last post, it seems like the family and friends were in the dark and they were out there looking for themselves, including going out to Allie's work. But the comments were interesting. First of all, of course, people are questioning a lot of things. That's what we do. When we don't have the answers, we're gonna keep questioning things. Llewellyn assures everyone the police were working hard since the minute they found out that Allie went missing and they were doing their jobs the best they can. One poster named Stacy said, how is it magically closed and under construction, but she worked on Monday? Something's not right here. And in response, Jennifer says, most businesses would post ahead of time that they're gonna be closed or there should be a permit if they're really doing construction. And sure, but we saw what they considered under construction and I'm not sure it really qualifies. Stacy responded saying, yeah, but it's weird. She disappeared on Monday and then Tuesday they're doing constructions and the cameras didn't work during the time she went missing. Someone named Nicole was writing about how the dumpsters out in the back had been blocked off with tape and there was a cop out there sitting right next to them. Stacy responds back that she had been out there in the area and there were three white SUVs across the street and two SUVs in the back with their hatches open and people standing there. 
Wow. I would definitely be curious to know what investigators were doing. I do have photos of what these people were explaining. This photo might have been taken a little later, but it does look like there are some cop cars parked in front of the dumpsters. And then the media who was on this did release this picture of a cop car, some police line do not cross tape, and it's sort of blocking off the local nine. And that's probably why it was closed when Allie's family went there to investigate. Darlene on Facebook was a former coworker of Allie's and you know what she wants to know? Well, yeah, why are they under construction? She said there's nothing in that place that needs to be under construction and it's really small. How convenient. But she said she's not surprised because no one had anything good to say about Jimmy or Georgios and that it was Jimmy and Georgios that always had something bad to say about others as well. But she just hopes and prays that Allie is safe. I can feel the frustration in these posts. You've got bad bosses, weird workplaces, a missing girl, and the tensions are rising. One poster named John agreed that it was really weird to be under construction the very next day with no prior notice. He remarked that the owner should just hang a sign on the front door that says hiding evidence closed permanently. Well, we know that the investigators have been in there. They've searched it before and they didn't see anything out of the ordinary, but of course, I'd think without any other news that this was all very odd. One person flat out said, I think the boss has something to do with it. They also asked if there were cameras at any of the other places nearby and if they could see anything. And Llewellyn assures them that the police, they're already on top of all of that. She said, anything we're thinking of, the police are already one step ahead and that's good. That's more than I can say in a lot of these cases, and I think you know what I mean. I'm only gonna read a few more because the police have a lot going on, and I wanna get to that. But from the outside looking in, the public have a lot to say. One poster named Shane said, so did I read this right? Cameras were not working one night, but work every other night? It seems legitimately sketchy. Someone named Taylor said that they actually worked there for months, and anytime they would do anything wrong, Georgios would call the shop because he was watching the cameras like a hawk. He even made sure that the connection was always good. So Taylor didn't think this was a coincidence. And that is very interesting. It does sound sketchy, doesn't it? And to add to all of this, the online sleuths pull up a review of Local 9 that was posted the day after Allie went missing. This was from an experience a customer had on October 29th. And I want to read it to you because it is very interesting. We don't always get to see this. Julie explained in the review, my friend and I stopped in for lunch today and we were not greeted when we entered. As a matter of fact, I didn't see anyone for a while. There were a couple of customers waiting for orders and it was apparent they weren't happy. A young man approached the counter to take her order and it was very obvious he was under the influence of something. As he took the order, he almost passed out and the other gentleman that was preparing food was very busy, but the man that took our order was just standing about. There's no seating because they're under construction at the moment, so we went outside to wait in the car. The customer that was waiting when we arrived came out with a sandwich, and after looking at it, he went back inside with the wrapper open. It was obvious something was wrong, and that was the end of the review, and it does seem like they were over their heads, which is why Giorgios had to hire someone. But are they just bad bosses? or are they bad people? Well, to get a little bit more insight on that, another former employee, Cindy, said that she worked at another establishment called Travers, and that was one that Giorgios owned as well, and she knew Jimmy. She said that there wasn't anything good to say about Jimmy. He was just a sub maker. He's not someone you can trust. And Giorgios, well, he just decided to leave Travers behind and open up this new place. And who did he decide to take with him? Jimmy, to help get everything ready to open and when it did open, she said they lost all their jobs. The person who didn't was Jimmy for some reason. So it really does seem like everyone's pointing the finger and has their eyes on Georgios and Jimmy, even the investigators. So they didn't get much out of Jimmy when he was inebriated during his initial interview. So they decided to show up really early at his house that day, October 31st. He was sober. So they once again asked him to come down to the station to give a formal statement. It's around 10 in the morning at this point, and this time Jimmy is so much better. He's so easy to talk to, have a conversation with, and after two hours, investigators really aren't getting much that they don't already know. Jimmy says he wants them to find Allie. He said she's a great worker and a friend. I want you to find her, okay? Trust me, I do, because I want my friend back, okay? Not only was she my friend, she was a hellified worker that I can never replace. 
And in the third hour, investigators start to feel like, you know what? We could be on the verge of a revelation in this case. They think there might be something that Jimmy wants to get off of his chest, or at least they want him to think they think that. So the investigators are playing the game they always do, giving Jimmy a way out, saying things like, maybe there was an accident and you witnessed it, and maybe you don't want to get anyone in trouble, but you feel like coming clean because you feel bad about what you saw. Is Giorgio's covering for himself? These were the things they were asking him, and Jimmy didn't answer. If he did, all he would say is, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like you're holding back. I tell you this much, I don't know where she is. She was fired when I seen her last. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. After hours of questioning, it looked like Jimmy was desperate to unburden himself of something, but he just kept holding back. The more they questioned him, the more they saw him kind of come forward and then push back a little bit. It was clear that he was holding a significant piece of the puzzle in Allie's disappearance. There was just something standing in his way of letting it out. So the investigators are working hard to make him feel safe enough to expose it. Meanwhile, that day back on Facebook, Llewellyn posts this picture of her and Allie on Halloween in the past. They're dressed up like cheetahs and she writes, I love you so much. This is an old picture, but one of my favorites. I pray that you're safe and warm somewhere. I pray that you're in no harm or haven't been. That was the end of her quote. But later that night, Llewellyn posted again, and it wasn't what anyone was expecting. It was shocking. Late that Halloween night, she revealed everyone's worst nightmare had come true, writing, well, since the news already released it, the search is off for my beautiful, amazing young sister. They found her dead, and the state investigators told us before it reached the news, we are not okay, not at all. Please, just send your prayers because we are beyond lost and have no words right now. Wow. I can't even begin to imagine how hard that was for her to write, let alone getting that news that Allie's no longer with us. The fact that it was already breaking news and the family hadn't even had time to process it yet is really sad. I only found one news outlet that reported it on Halloween when Allie's body was discovered. Of course, I'm going to get into all of that. But here's a part of that article, and it looks so thrown together at the last minute, just to be the first to reveal that Allie was dead. How sad. There wasn't much information about how she died or where or how she was discovered. It did, however, say that more information was expected to be released at a Friday morning press conference the next day at Troop G headquarters. Well, why couldn't they wait? Well, because you know how news is. It turns out that earlier that day, investigators had information that led them to a wooded area east of an on-ramp to Interstate 87 at the southbound entrance near Exit 13 in a town called Malta, which is about a 45-minute drive from Gloversville. They were initially checking this area for any evidence of Ellie's whereabouts, and they were looking in the swampy marshland off the highway. They used drones and they used canines, and ultimately, they uncovered the unclothed, muddy remains of a female. She was 25 feet into the woods in between the ramp and the highway. This is the actual burial site. It's a very wet and muddy area. The hole was dug into the marshy ground, making more water come to the surface and the body was placed inside and then covered with cement in this shallow grave. Then branches and stone blocks, dirt, mud, and brush were thrown on top of it at an attempt to conceal it. Once the body was removed from the makeshift grave and transported to the medical examiner's office, it was determined to be that of 22-year-old Elizabeth Lamont, and it was clear that she had sustained multiple blunt force injuries to her head with multiple skull fractures, and this ultimately caused damage to her brain and her death. Who had done this to her and why? Well, after getting surveillance video from a nearby business, it showed the front parking lot and the front door to Local 9. It showed employees leaving the store as early as 6 p.m. Georgios is seen giving one of those employees a ride and then coming back to Local 9 with Jimmy waiting outside the front door for him. This is around 6, 12 p.m. Allie is never seen leaving. And oddly, Jimmy is seen on camera getting into Giorgio's black 2008 VW Passat wagon and they proceed to drive to the back of this building out of sight of the cameras. Suspicious. Very. The Passat isn't seen leaving this area again until about 8 o'clock. 
and coming back sometime later around 8.45, going straight to the back of the building once again, out of sight, before leaving for a final time later that night. Allie is still never seen coming out of that store. It was suspected that was because she was in the back of Giorgio's Passat, and not by her own will, of course. Although I am sure that Giorgio could argue that he was waiting for Allie and Jimmy to get done that night so he could graciously give them rides home like he'd done with the other employee. But remember, he and Jimmy already told police they both saw Allie leave early that night, between 7 and 8 o'clock after the soda machine broke, and Giorgio loaned her some money. That's not caught on camera. So how did she leave? Did she go through the back somehow? Why? This is where the sub shop used to be. This is the front door, and this business across the street has a clear view from cameras. However, from the front, when you drive around the building to where the dumpsters are, as well as the back doors, this isn't in the sight of any cameras. Why would Allie come out of the back door? It just didn't seem right. Plus, she would have called Jenny or William to get a ride, which never happened. She just abruptly stopped messaging William around 6.39 p.m., which is after Jimmy and Giorgios were seen driving to the backside of this building together. It was time to put the pressure on Jimmy. They didn't want to say too much because they wanted to give him the opportunity to tell them what he knew or what he was hiding. They kept urging him to tell his secret, tell them what he knows. Maybe he witnessed something and he's trying to cover for his boss. They just kept pressing. Something went too far that night and then kept trying to figure it out. You have the answer to the puzzle here. I need to clear my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. And finally, Jimmy said that he was ready to tell them everything, but he asked for something. He wanted the DA to sign a document stating that if he told them what happened, they wouldn't hold him liable. They would let him walk away, get on a bus, and disappear. I want it signed by the DA that everything that you guys leave me the alone. I walk out of here, you put me on a bus, and I can go. Well, the investigators were like, listen, we can't promise you anything because we haven't heard the details. It all depends on what he's about to tell them. Clearly, he said, if you tell us that she overdosed and you got scared and you hid her body, that's one thing. But for example, this investigator was like, if we go out there and we find her cut in pieces, no, that's not going to fly. We're not going to be able to not hold you liable when something like that was done. But we know people can usually get a reduction in time served or a reduction in charges if you come clean. So Jimmy was ready to do so. And suddenly, you see him, he's leaning over a garbage can in the interrogation room, opening up a pack of cigarettes, just holding one in his hand. And then there was this deep, guttural laugh that came out of his throat. It was this evil laugh that the detective said made a chill run down his spine. <laughs> and that's when Jimmy said, you don't even know. And it's scary. You don't even know. You really don't. Look at him. His face, you know what it actually reminds me of? It reminds me, and I'm wearing an R.L. Stein shirt, it reminds me of the R.L. Stein Goosebumps books, the one with the dummy. Do you remember that one? It's like a marionette doll. It's creepy. That's exactly what this man looks like. Pure evil. It's almost like he's reliving the moment that this happened in his mind. And the story he told was very disturbing. He said that Giorgios offered him money to get rid of Ali. Yeah. And the investigators have no idea what the motive could be. And they don't know if Jimmy's even telling them the truth, but they keep listening. Jimmy said that back on October 25th, he and Giorgios met in his parked car behind Local 9. And during that meeting, they discussed getting rid of Allie. And Giorgios gave Jimmy $300 to take care of her. The plan was to kill her on Sunday, October 27th. And initially, Giorgios was having Jimmy do this all by himself. Giorgios said, you know what? We could stage it as an accidental drug overdose or a failed robbery. However, after thinking about this, Giorgio was like, no, 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 no. If a body is discovered inside of my business, it would tarnish the deli's reputation. The pair conspired together. Jimmy would hit Allie with a baseball bat and conceal her body in a large sandwich preparation cooler. He would hide it and then eventually take it out and dispose of it. It's so disgusting. Yet the day before the planned murder, Jimmy had a change of heart. He told Giorgios, I cannot go through with it. And Giorgios was really angry. 
especially because he already paid him to get the job done. Imagine $300 being worth taking someone else's life. It's unbelievable. But Jimmy said he berated him because he was hesitating. He was questioning his manhood. And ultimately, Giorgios came to the decision that he could no longer trust Jimmy to get this done alone. So they met up the following day on Monday, October 28th, and drove a U-Haul truck to pick up a new oven for their store. And during that drive, they discussed their new plan. According to Jimmy's confession, the initial plan was to get Allie high and strangle her. However, during that drive, they changed their minds. Instead, Georgios instructed Jimmy to hit Allie over the head with a metal baseball bat that Georgios kept in his car. And afterward, they planned to clean the shop and bury her body. But Jimmy told Giorgios there's no way he could do this sober. He said, I need money for drugs and alcohol. So he gave Jimmy 500 more dollars so that he could buy all the drugs he needed to get high enough to kill Ali. That night, he even brought him a case of beer. And according to Jimmy, Giorgios let everyone else go home early. And then he told poor Ali to stay just a little longer to help them clean, do some dishes, and empty some soda syrup bags into the sink at the back of the store. She was just standing there doing her job. Jimmy snuck up behind her. He had that aluminum baseball bat, and while her back was turned, he swung as hard as he could, and he hit her right in the back of the head. He said the sound was so terrible, it sounded like branches breaking. Allie, of course, didn't see it coming at all. She was completely caught off guard. And the plan had initially been that Jimmy was supposed to wait. He was supposed to put a big garbage bag, an industrial garbage bag over Allie's head and then strike her. And this was supposed to contain the blood, but that didn't go as planned. However, right after the first strike, Giorgios had a bag ready and he put it over Allie's head and he started to suffocate her. But this woman fought so hard, harder than they imagined she would. She was kicking violently and trying to get free. After the first blow, while Giorgio was holding this bag over Allie's head, Jimmy hit her three more times in the skull. And despite her extensive injuries at this point, Allie continued to struggle for her life. Even after being knocked to the ground with a bag over her head, and Georgios was frustrated. He started to choke her, but she still wasn't dead. She was still moving. So he yelled to Jimmy, go get something heavier. She's not dying. She's not going down. She was still frantically kicking. And that's when Jimmy returned with a 2.5 pound sledgehammer, and he took it and struck Allie in the head with all of his might. Then Giorgio took over, and he hit her too over the head again and again with that hammer. Then this man proceeded to choke her until she stopped twitching. That's when Jimmy said he looked over at Giorgio's, and he had this expression of happiness on his face. Then he spoke something in a different language, and then he checked Allie's pulse before saying, it's over. After these two evil monsters determined that Allie was dead, they looked at the scene and they realized there was way more blood than they had anticipated. And they were not prepared to clean up a mess like that. First, they had to remove her body. But before doing so, Giorgios callously took the $500 that he lent to Allie out of her pocket, hands it over to James along with Allie's cell phone, and he says, good job. That is just gross. Jimmy claimed that he broke her phone while he was trying to unlock it, and eventually he just threw it away. He also explained that Georgios had already purchased items from Walmart earlier that day in preparation for the attack, including work gloves, pants, and a sweatshirt to wear, along with lawn fertilizer. He thought that this would expedite the natural decomposition process of Allie's body once they disposed of her. So they began wrapping her up in garbage bags that they had on hand and securing them in place with duct tape. When it came time to cover up their heinous crime, their genius plan was to cut the soda machine lines and flood this entire floor with the red soda syrup to conceal the blood. That way they could buy some time, they would pretend that the back area was under construction as they put it, and they could even have workers help them clean up without even knowing they were concealing a murder. Then they would concoct the heartfelt tale they told investigators about giving Allie an extra $500 and sending her home like true gentlemen because they cared so much about her. Remember, Giorgio said she was like a daughter? Well, this plan backfired when they realized just how messy soda syrup really is. 
It was way too much for them to handle with the cleaning supplies they had. So they jumped inside Giorgio's car and they headed back over to Walmart together where they picked up plastic sheeting, duct tape, rags, soap, bleach. And when they returned, Jimmy said he saw Giorgio's wipe down the sledgehammer with a rag soaked in bleach and water. After they finally managed to clean up most of the mess and wash away their sins, or so they thought, they loaded up Giorgio's Volkswagen with Allie's body, as well as bags and bags of items associated with this murder. And then they drove out of town to Malta. And when they were driving, they threw the items out of the window in all different places, scattering evidence all over the place before placing Allie's naked body in an undignified makeshift shallow grave filled with fertilizer and cement before covering it with foliage. Well, when Jimmy was done telling the investigators all this, they thought it was quite a tale, but they weren't sure they believed it. To prove it was true, Jimmy told them where he knew they could find the bat. He said he threw it into a pond out in the wetlands off Dean Lung Road in Galway. It was on Roland Street in the town of Milton. This is where it is on the map. Here is the lake. So investigators drove out there with Jimmy and it didn't take them long to retrieve the bat because Jimmy didn't realize that it would float. So there it was on the surface in some brush along the edge of the pond. After this finding, the investigators were more open to believing what Jimmy said was true. As they were driving back towards the main road though, Jimmy stopped them and pointed out to an area in the woods along the same street where he said they dumped a bag of trash. Sure enough, about 20 feet off the road, they spot a black garbage bag. It's sitting there right behind a tree with a brown tarp sticking out of it. When they opened the garbage bag, they found a roll of duct tape, an interior car mat, a rolled up tarp, plastic with what appeared to be bloodstains, as well as a number of dirty plastic gloves, rags, miscellaneous garbage like Bud Light cans, and the packaging for the plastic sheet, the packaging for the garbage bags, and other items like a dirty mop. There were also a number of smaller black plastic bags with cleaning materials in them. It's just nasty looking at all that. Clearly, these were items used to clean up the mess inside the back of Local 9. Now it was time for Jimmy to lead them to where Allie's body was. He warned them that they were going to need tools, at least shovels, and a sledgehammer to break through the concrete they had poured on top of her. They sent a team to the ramp off Interstate 87 and located Allie's burial spot. I showed you this earlier. Jimmy explained that he was so heavily intoxicated at the time of disposing Allie's body that Giorgio had to incentivize him by throwing money at him so he would continue to dig her grave. It's amazing just how little value some people can place on human life and how ignorant they are to believe that they're not gonna get caught, that you're not gonna get seen on Walmart cameras, that you're not gonna be seen on any cameras. Since 2019, investigators obtained that surveillance footage from that Walmart, which is only a five minute drive from Local 9, and sure enough, they catch Giorgios alone on the camera buying Clorox wipes, duct tape, cleaning supplies, and 55-gallon garbage bags. But not only that, he was a little hungry, I guess, after all that work, and he picked up an Almond Joy candy bar and some laundry detergent, just like he was going about a normal day. Not that he had killed someone. There was still a lot to learn, but investigators had enough to call him back to the station for one more interview, a more intense one this time. But as soon as they read him his rights... Giorgio asked for a lawyer. There was still so much to this story that wasn't revealed yet. Most importantly though, they had enough evidence to arrest both Giorgio and his little do boy, James Jimmy Duffy. Here's the press release that was done following the arrests. Major Robert Panat spoke and he talked about the investigation, the drones, and the canines that helped them find Allie's body. On November 1st, the day after Allie's family got the news that she was never coming back, her sister Llewellyn posted this to Facebook. She said, quote, I haven't said much. I had this constant ache in my throat and chest. The feeling my family and I are feeling are feelings I never imagined one could feel. I'm hurt and angry. I'm sad and devastated. I love my sister. I miss her more than I could ever express to any of you. I cannot thank everyone enough for the love and support you're all showing my sister and family. It's a hard concept to grasp that I will never see, hug, smell or hear from my sister ever again. My sister was brutally murdered. This is why I cannot accept what has happened, but I really just want to tell everyone thank you. Your support means more than any of you know right now." End quote. 
How incredibly sad. And she's right. It would be very hard to grasp that someone close to you is just gone forever. No saying goodbye, nothing. On Monday, November 4th, a vigil was held for Ali at Myers Park. It was a very emotional event, but the colors and the candles of the park brought some brightness to this occasion. Allie's loved ones gathered to pay their respects and remember her life. Llewellyn posted that purple, green, and bright pink were her favorite colors. People came out wearing purple shirts to honor Allie. During the vigil, one of Allie's coworkers spoke up about the tragedy that had taken place. She expressed her disbelief at what happened. It was unfathomable. The coworker also talked about how dedicated Allie was to her job. She had given her all to that shop. The coworker also condemned the actions of Georgios and Jimmy. She described their actions as horrendous and unforgivable. The first thought that crossed their mind when she went missing is that they needed to look into Georgios and Jimmy. This coworker just had a gut feeling, and ultimately this intuition proved to be correct. A Lamont family friend told the news that Allie's family was ripped apart. They would never be normal again, and how they would have to live without Allie forever and how intense their pain was. One person who attended the vigil didn't even know Allie, but wanted to pay their respects, and she posted this to the event page. Quote, I close my eyes and I pray. I didn't know her but I was there to support an innocent young girl who just went into work one day like a normal person and got hurt by her own bosses. When I saw on Facebook a local girl went missing, I prayed like crazy. Sadly, by all the things, I knew the boss had something going on with it. My heart and soul hurt for her and her family and friends. Why on earth would someone do this to a hardworking, kind person? Sickening. Rest in peace, beautiful girl. I'm glad they caught these sick men and sorry you went through this. I couldn't imagine how scared you were. Everyone lit candles and they let balloons go in her honor. There were still so many unanswered questions and people wanted answers. People knew these men were evil, but why Allie? What could she have ever done to deserve this? Well, they'd have to wait to get those answers. But by November 27th, Llewellyn shared this picture of an urn with Allie's ashes inside. She wrote, this is what my family is left with. This hurts my heart so bad. I just sat here and cried for what feels like forever holding you, but I'm beyond thankful that you'll be home for Thanksgiving. I love you so, so much, Elizabeth and Lamont. This is all we have left of you, and I will cherish this forever and eternity. I will always have you with me and my necklace with you in it too. I feel better knowing you're home with us, just not the way you should be. Rest easy, my beautiful sister. I talk to you every day and for the rest of my life will continue to do so. How incredibly and sad. The pain that they have to endure losing someone this way and all they have is her ashes. By the time the preliminary hearing was set, both men had been appointed attorneys to represent them. More of the story was unfolding. And since Jimmy had confessed that he was paid to assist in the killing, he had to make a choice. Either take a plea deal or place his fate in the hands of a jury at trial. Well, he didn't want to accept a plea. He wanted a manslaughter conviction instead of a murder conviction because he wanted to spend less time behind bars. However, the court said that they were not prepared to accept a plea of manslaughter without a 25-year determinant sentence, including life imprisonment. So Jimmy Duffy defiantly declared, quote, okay, it looks like we're going to trial. I'll bring my popcorn, end quote. And those were his exact words. Once this case was presented to the grand jury, both Georgios and Jimmy were indicted for first-degree intentional homicide, including the aggravating factor of a contract killing, which elevated both of their charges to a potential life sentence without the possibility of parole. Jimmy agreed to testify against his former boss, and the prosecution built their case. Meanwhile, time was going by. Allie's family was trying to cope. Her little sister, Brooke, posted this picture of the two of them on Facebook on June 11, 2020, and said, quote, Another day I wake up and you're not here, screaming, crying for you in my dreams. I desperately need your advice. Your laugh is a bezel to my brain. God, why'd you have to take my sissy, my best friend, my biggest supporter? I crave your hugs. I want to see you smile and tell me I love you so much, sissy. Man, half my heart is gone. I can't sleep because I picture you. Damn, man, why did you take her? I will never understand. I'll never be okay. But if there's something I know, I gotta keep going for you, Allie. I promise you I'd never give up. I can't wait till the day I see you again." End quote. I can't even imagine how painful that is. And I bet it never 
goes away. Almost 18 months after their heinous crimes on May 12, 2021, Georgios Kakavelos was tried in a Saratoga County courthouse. The trial lasted for six weeks and had over 60 witnesses and 700 pieces of evidence. During their opening statement, the prosecution presented a strong case. They alleged that this murder was planned and Georgios was the mastermind and that he considered Ali the ringleader of a group of disgruntled workers and wanted to kill her to keep her quiet, to keep him out of trouble with the Department of Labor. But of course, the defense came forward with a totally different story in their opening. Jimmy was the monster. The defense claimed that Georgios was just an innocent bystander who walked in that deli that night and he was shocked to find Jimmy standing over Allie's dead body. And then Jimmy threatened him with a knife saying he would kill him and his family if he didn't help him clean up and dispose of her body. His court-appointed attorney made him out to look like this upstanding businessman with a wife and three children that was coerced into helping Jimmy cover up his evil plan. And they painted Jimmy to be just this alcoholic drug user who was violent and emotional and had deep hatred for women. And that his motive was either infatuation with Ali and she rejected his advances, or she owed him money for drugs. Although in his interviews prior to his arrest, Georgios was saying, oh, Jimmy's my right-hand man. He's a great employee. He's Ali's buddy. And we know Jimmy had a girlfriend named Kristen. So was he really a woman hater or was that Georgios? During the prosecution's case, however, evidence including phone records, financial statements, and of course the Walmart security videos definitely undermine Georgios' claims. In fact, his actions in stopping to buy an Almond Joy in a magazine right after the murder was telling. It showed his state of mind at the time of the crime. It was indicative of a cold, blooded killer's mentality. It didn't align with someone who just stumbled across this vicious murder and who was being blackmailed against his will. The real story, according to the prosecution, was that on September 10th, an investigator came out from the Department of Labor and they were unannounced. No one was at the local nine except for Allie and another coworker. So she did the right thing. She told them what she knew about Giorgio's mistreatment of his employees. Things like he didn't pay on time or sometimes didn't pay his employees at all. And he would only pay in cash, never keeping any records. This caused many of the employees to quit. Allie was still there because she didn't have a car. She wanted to look for other jobs, but she couldn't drive to interviews or get to those jobs, especially if they weren't close by. She was so close to being able to afford her own apartment, so she just stuck it out. Allie didn't know that being honest about what was happening to her and her fellow employees would get her killed. So Allie tells Jimmy about the encounter with the investigator from the Department of Labor, thinking that he's a trusted friend. But he goes right to his boss and he becomes irate. And then Georgios begins getting letters from the Department of Labor. They wanted payroll records. When he spoke to Allie about this, she stood up for herself and her coworkers by saying he needed to do the right thing or she would expose him on social media and to the auditors. He needed to pay them what he owed. And I was thinking how many of us have either done this or said we were gonna do this if someone didn't do the right thing. Like we're gonna blast you on social media because it's something so simple, but something so threatening in this case. And it didn't sit well with Georgios. Allie had been acting like the manager ever since Jimmy was always high and drunk on the job. She was the one dealing with the employees that weren't getting paid. She would blatantly tell them, you're better than this place. And if they found another job, take it and run. Evidence showed that Allie was willing to make sacrifices for her colleagues. She wanted to make sure they were paid on time and she would even tip them out of her own earnings before getting paid herself. But according to Jimmy, Allie aired the store's dirty laundry and Georgios referred to her as a bitch on numerous occasions. She messed up all of his plans because he was on the verge of finalizing plans to move to a new location. Remember how he did that before? He was in one town, he stopped working that shop, opened up another one. He just keeps hopping from location to location and I wonder why. But Ali was messing all of that up and ruining his reputation. Plus, the investigation into his business dealings showed he owed over $122,000 to the IRS and $70,000 to the state of New York, including unpaid payroll and sales tax. Ali threatened to continue to expose him if he didn't own up to it, but that's something he just wasn't willing to do. Instead, you know what was worth his time? Killing his employee. There was also evidence that following the crime, he bought custom-fitted plywood at a store 
and installed it on top of the flooring in his trunk. Hmm, why'd you do that? And then he proceeded to get his entire car detailed. This man's glasses were found at the disposal site where Allie's body was found. The defense tried to argue that this was because Jimmy grabbed them off of his face and threw him over there to silence Giorgios. Giorgio was claiming that Jimmy did this so that some evidence belonged to Giorgios and he wouldn't come forward and rat him out. That wasn't all. Giorgio had been involved in fraudulent activities for more than two decades. So this was just the tip of the iceberg. Ultimately, the jury rejected his fictional tale and sided with the prosecution, finding Giorgios Cacavelos guilty of all charges, including first-degree murder, on June 17, 2021. Now for sentencing. During a pre-sentencing interview, a probation officer came forward and said that he observed Giorgios to be emotionless and detached. He failed to humanize his victim, Ali Lamont. He refused to call her by name, and he kept calling her Allison, which is just total disrespect. During the course of the sentencing, Ali's family and loved ones read their victim impact statements, and I could hardly keep it together. Giorgios was just emotionless. He's a father. Just think about that. I fail to understand how he can separate the love that he feels for his own children and the fact that he can kill someone else's daughter. A woman named Roberta Reardon, the commissioner of the New York State Department of Labor, she made an unusual move. She wrote a letter to the court and she requested a severe sentence for Georgios. The judge actually read this letter. Here it is now. It says, quote, Elizabeth came forward in good faith to report labor law violations to the Department of Labor to fight for justice for herself and her colleagues and became the victim of the most heinous act of retaliation against a worker that the New York State Department of Labor has ever seen. I asked the court to consider the potential chilling effect in terms of sentencing that this murderer's actions will have on workers who seek to exercise a basic and fundamental right, the right to report mistreatment and violations of the law. Workers in New York State must be able to report labor law violations without fear of retaliation, end quote. It's true. All she was doing was the right thing. But sometimes it can go so wrong. Allie's sister, Brooke, spoke, and she said that when he took her sister, he took a part of her as well. And while sobbing, she said, quote, Allie was the light of the room. A contagious smile and a laugh you could never forget. She would help anybody unless you gave her a reason not to. She was strong, caring, loving, and hardworking, and you took that all away. You robbed her of the chance to ever get married, to have children, or simply be an aunt to her nieces and nephews. You tried to silence her, but she will always be remembered. She bravely went on to tell Georgios that he had no regard for human life. She said, you disgust me. You make me physically sick. You're a woman-hating, narcissistic piece of shit who lies to get his own way. Allie's aunt Tammy spoke and expressed the family's grief and loss, saying, quote, to us, Allie will always be 22. We only have 22 years of memories of her. We will hold our memories in our hearts forever. I hope you never get a moment's peace for what you did. Your Honor, we ask that you sentence him to the same thing he sentenced us to, life without parole. In Allie's father's victim impact statement, he referred to his daughter as his hero. Allie's older sister also wrote to the court saying, quote, she worked herself to death, literally, to try to achieve her personal and lifelong goals, end quote. And finally, it was Allie's mom's turn. I could not hold it together during this, but some of the things she said were that he was a failure as a businessman and a failure as a human being. But she said, above all else, until the day you die, she will be in your head. You killed our daughter because you owed her money, and she stuck up for herself and others that you hurt she wouldn't be quiet. For the rest of our lives, we will not be quiet. Well, that room was silent as the weight of her mom's words sunk in. And she continued with, quote, we will keep speaking about Elizabeth and the horrific acts that you committed to make sure you never have the chance to hurt anyone else. Giorgio's lawyer appealed to the judge for a minimum sentence. He said that this was his client's first encounter with the criminal justice system. And he highlighted his status as a local business owner who provided employment to many people in the community and that had me laughing. Are you serious? And his lawyer also described him as a devoted husband and father of his three children. And this was supposed to mitigate his sentence. I mean, clearly he was one hell of a family man, right? Because he didn't forget to get his wife some laundry detergent, did he? That's right, 
That was for her. Even in the midst of a murder plot, he stopped and remembered to bring something home for his beloved wife. Unbelievable. But of course, the court didn't place much weight on this at all. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And Jimmy Duffy, he received a sentence of only 18 years to life. I always say only because you never know. He offered a very simple apology to the Lamont family. He sounds like a coward to me. All in all, Ali was forced to pay the ultimate price for Giorgio's greed, despite attempting to make things right not only for herself, but for her coworkers. So this court's decision tried to bring some measure of justice to Ali and her family, but we know there's never closure, and though justice has been done, it doesn't amount to what this family lost. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for giving Ali your time. My thoughts are with her family and friends. Another young person taken away before they had a chance to live out their dreams. So let's remember Ali, let's think of her and so many others that I've talked about on this channel as we live out our lives. Thank you so very much. I will see you in my next video. Bye.